You're listening to the Pulled by the Root podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Heidi Marble, host of the Pulled by the Root podcast. My time with Nicole Kaharik was so spectacular. We bonded over motherhood, being adoptees. I also read her blog post to her about motherhood, and we had, well, I had (laughs) a meltdown. Um, She is just light and love and positive energy. She is one of those people that gives you hope in the darkness. She has been able to heal her life in a way that she is able to go about her days feeling mostly peace, which I think so many of us struggle with. There is so much to learn from Nicole and to learn from this episode. I am really a student right now listening to all of you. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pulled by the Root podcast. I am so thrilled to introduce you to an incredible woman. Her name is Nicole, and she is a writer, um, just an amazing human being. I'm going to read her bio to you right now. Nicole is a domestic adoptee raised by a single father. She has many years of insight from soul searching, understanding her identity, and to become her best self in the world. She has learned about the lifelong journey of adoption from experts through service and local community organizations that support everyone touched by adoption. She has also spent countless hours reading about adoption, connecting with fellow adoptees, and reflecting on her experiences. The work has helped her understand how being abandoned and adopted adopted shapes personality, thought patterns, decisions, and relationships with others. After choosing to accept and love herself, she confidently can say that she has made progress, but that she's also a work in progress. She created a blog as a place for adoptees to share their journey of self-discovery. And while being an adoptee is part of her identity, it does not define who she is. And we will make sure we provide all the links so that you can read more about Nicole. Oh my goodness, Nicole. So there's so much I want to talk to you about, but I think it's really important for all of the people listening, which we hope are many and varied, that you can tell us as much as you would like to about your adoption story. Because when I read it, I I had to sit down. It it, it really, yeah. So I just want to sit back and allow you to, to speak your truth. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks for having me. And hello to all my fellow adoptees out there. Um, I'm honored to honored to be here and to share with you all today. Um, so my story started with um, being abandoned as an infant. And um, my mother left me with a babysitter um, and never returned. And the sitter was a young man who had just um, returned from serving our country in Vietnam, in the Marine Corps, and um, he and my mother were actually romantically involved. And uh, while I'm not his biologically, um, he uh, really, um, you know, watched me secretly for a while. And um, he was sad, obviously, um, about the relationship and the disappearance of uh, my mother and he, I believe, um, through my conversations with him, really planned to share his life with her. But um, he fell in love with the baby girl she left behind and uh, chose to dedicate his life uh, after his service to our country to uh, the purpose of uh, raising that baby as a single father. And um, when I was uh, three years old, my uh, adoption was final and Robert. Robert D. Kelly, uh, now Father Kelly, uh, recently retired uh, priest, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, legally became my father when I was three. Uh, so I was uh, raised um, by a single father who is an amazing person who I love very much. And he's taught me a lot. And he's definitely, um, you know, uh, a shining star in, in my uh, story and in my life. And we're very close uh, to this day. Wow. Um, So that's the childhood. That's the the how it happened. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
I have to say, you know, over the years before I became engaged in the adoptee community and really understood how adoption impacted me and abandonment impacted me, I used to just tell the happy parts, right? And everyone would light up and listen to my story and say, wow, that's so beautiful. But uh, what I've come to realize, and I think more importantly, especially as I read the stories of my fellow adoptees out there, um, while I knew my story at a young age, um, and I had a great upbringing, and I wouldn't change a thing about you know um, the values I was raised with, and all the opportunity I was given. Um, I did uh, have a lot of love, but I also had a lot of pain. So. Uh, I had questions. I, I was confused. Um, I had painful under feelings. I just didn't really understand. And I, um, you know, really felt like an alien as a, as a child because I didn't look like anyone in my family. I didn't look like anyone at school and I felt very disconnected, um, to others. Uh, and, uh, while I had all the love in the world, um, that couldn't, you know, fix uh, the challenges that I was, I was facing. And in retrospect, I figured out what it was and that it was linked to being abandoned. But as a child, I didn't know that. And I felt inferior. I felt like damaged. I felt something was wrong with me. And I always wondered what's wrong with me. And of course, knowing that the person who's supposed to love you uh, for, you know, unconditionally and brought you into this world left, it reinforces that feeling of inferiority. And that was a real problem for me. Uh, and in the quiet moments, I really was sad. And obviously, I learned later um, that that sadness was really grief um, from the mother who left me behind. But I wasn't able to share uh, those feelings because I was so scared, even though I knew my father and his family loved me. And I do think they love me unconditionally um, and still do. I was so scared to share my truth and my feelings because I thought I might be left behind again. And I had to be, you know, this good, perfect little girl and make sure that I got good grades in school and was successful because I never wanted to be sent away or I never wanted to, you know, lose, uh, lose more loved ones. So um, growing up was really challenging in that regard. Uh, not taking anything away from uh, my father, but that's one of the lessons I've learned through my own story is that no matter how good of an experience um, you have with adoption and speaking from personal experience, it, it doesn't take the take away that lifelong uh, challenge that um, and that pain that adoption leaves behind. And that's what people need to really understand and um, re realize and accept uh, instead of, you know, celebrating um, the, the new family. Um, while I'm, I'm, you know, thankful for, for everything that I had growing up, uh, I wish someone had asked me how I felt and I wish I would have had a support network back then and I would have understood earlier in life that it was connected to my adoption. But um, I didn't find that out until later after I did start volunteering in my local um, adoptee community. Yeah, so, so um, well. Yeah, so I, that's well really said. where the hope came in. <laughs> yeah, uh, the hope came from connecting with others and connecting with adoptees and uh, professionals at Adoption Network Cleveland and um, learning about adoption as a lifelong journey. And actually they called it a process back in the time. That was a long time ago. I'm dating myself, but I was in my twenties back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I started when I was uh, pretty early in my marketing career and I've been in marketing now for um, over 20 years. So that would tell you uh, if you could do the math. <laughs> But well, you look um, amazing. I <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, sometimes you you feel uh, um, you know just ragged. <laughs> it's a, mm -hmm. a long time. But um, what I learned from uh, being part of Adoption Network Cleveland and uh, working um, 
in the adoptee community and sharing my story and hearing other stories and helping uh, Adoption Network Cleveland with their special events, which is how I joined the organization as a volunteer. Um, it's funny because I thought I had something to give them. I wanted to give back to my community and I had no idea that this, you know, that decision would lead to this eye-opening experience that really helped me put my life in perspective and feel much better about why I felt the way I did. And, you know, for the first time, I, I kind of felt normal. And, um, you know, my feelings were accepted and other people felt just like me. So uh, I'd say connecting with other people touched by adoption really changed everything for me. I, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I'm new to all of this, even though I'm 55. And it's just been the most impactful thing to be able to know that all of you exist out there. I was in such denial myself about all of it. And, and I think it's just, um, it's really incredible to, to hear your story. And I wonder, you know, was it a gradual realization? Because I know for me, that sensation of something is wrong I didn't sort out exactly what that was until my fifties. So did it, how did that happen for you where you realized, Oh my goodness, what I'm feeling is directly connected to adoption. Was it, was it one, I mean, how, how did you arrive at that? Wow. Yeah. And I have to repay the compliment because you look amazing for your age too. <laughs> I, well, I, I would have I never guessed that. You know I, I'll tell you what, I tell people now, I'm like, I accept all the compliments I can get. So I will take it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We need to learn that, right? <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to um, do that sometimes. It's hard, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was a definitely gradual, um, a series of conversations and uh, insights. Um, like I said, when I joined Adoption Network Cleveland, I was definitely still in the fog and just wanted to use my marketing skill in the community and, you know, do good, do good work and give back. And I, I talked to uh, the executive director and founder of Adoption Network Cleveland, Betsy Norris, um, and she uh, really uh, kind of mentored me and and, you know, asked me some good questions and um, it helped me, um, kind of, you know, think about, uh, the lifelong, um, journey of adoption. And at the time they called it, uh, they used very clinical terms. It was called a, a lifelong process. And, um, I actually, uh, advised them since I was in the communication field, I said, you know, let, let's call it a journey because the people who are impacted by adoption are, um, you know, it's an emotional thing. It's hard to talk about uh, when you don't understand it. And sometimes, you know, it takes a long time, that journey of self-discovery. Uh, so we started calling it a journey and I had the opportunity to interact with the uh, professionals on, you know, the search committees and other uh, board members. I, I went on, um, I was so uh, into the organization and um, and the work that I was doing. And I felt great every time I was there and had these conversations because the first time I connected with other people who had those weird feelings that um, I had that I'd never understood until then. And I just started, you know, talking about, you know, what it felt like growing up and other people would say very similar things. And I, you know, it was really my fellow volunteers who were also adoptees who, um, you know, having those conversations with them and, you know, saying, uh, you know, sometimes I'm not sure why I'm just really unhappy and I feel like unfulfilled or, or like, like pieces of me are missing. And, um, you know, other people had similar, uh, similar feelings and, I had that safe space to open up and to share those feelings and to hear other stories. And then um, after uh, I was on the special events committee, I ended up, um, actually, I wanted to join the organization. Uh, they had a role uh, open and I talked to Betsy about um, about the role and uh 
unfortunately being in the nonprofit community, um, I was young and I had a, a young son to, to raise at the time. And, um, you know, it wasn't going to work out long-term, but she said, I do want to help you fulfill that need to be part of this organization. And then she asked me to join the board and that really opened my eyes to, you know, the bigger picture as well, because, uh, the board was made up of, um, many people touched by adoption, you know, um, the whole trial. I had. So it was really, um, you know, an, another extension of my experience. So it was, I'd say over a, a multi-year period, uh, that I had these conversations. And I think the journey of self-discovery is ongoing. And just like the journey of adoption, I don't think it ever ends. And that's why I write. And that's why I'm always trying to be the best version of myself. And I have, you know, room for improvement. And I want to inspire other adoptees to continue growing on their journeys and really understand who they are and what they're capable of. Because I think um, some of our negative feelings can hold us back. And uh, I am fortunate that I, you know, identified those feelings and how they were holding me back and was able to work through it. And of course, the, the pain never completely ends. But I definitely feel very liberated um, kind of just being in touch with myself and knowing what my triggers are and, um, you know, knowing how I can change the way I see myself and give myself a lot more credit than I ever have before. And that's what I wish for other adoptees is just to, you know, believe in, believe in yourself. It changes everything. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's so necessary in all of this is that there's hope. And that even though the pain can't be eradicated, we can find a way to, I don't know, cohabitate with it, if you will. And you know, you had mentioned your writing and you're such a beautiful writer, Nicole, so beautiful. And if this might be a really good time to point out, if if you don't mind, like if I could just read The Missing Moms, I just thought it was such a beautiful part. I'll try not to cry, but you can read it. (laughs) That's why Uh, I write instead of do video, because I'm emotional. (laughs) Yeah, because I think the impact on our children of us being adopted, it definitely counts. And this, this was just so beautiful. So I will share it. If you've ever wondered how Mother's Days impacts adoptees, here are my raw, sincere feelings. Each day you cross my mind, some more than others, especially today and every Mother's Day. Today is a day dedicated to celebrating you, celebrating us, but there is no us. How am I going to get through this? I have never experienced you in a way that calls for celebrating. Missing mom memories. I've never heard your voice. Read me a bedtime story or comfort my fears. I don't even know your voice. I never asked you why the sky is blue or where babies come from. I never had anyone to call mom. I never saw my own baby photo. I never fell into your arms after taking my first steps. I never made you a card or a homemade gift. I never experienced the joy of telling you about the childhood crush or shopping for my first date. I never shared my hopes and my dreams with you. I never had a single opportunity to make you proud. Celebrating today. Today I celebrate him. Today I celebrate my greatest gift. Today, I celebrate my choice to take a different path. Today, I celebrate all the mom memories I do have. Today, I celebrate the overwhelming joy of seeing my reflection in another person for the first time. Today, I celebrate every bedtime story I've ever read to him. Today, I celebrate our beautiful bond. Today, I celebrate every card and homemade gift he made for me. Today, I celebrate every time. I calmed his fears with my voice. Today, I celebrate every giggle, every hug, every time I carried him to bed. Today, I celebrate every one of his first and his bright future. Today, I celebrate the millions of moments he has made me proud. Today, I celebrate a love that makes me feel whole. Today, I also celebrate what he will never have to experience. He will never have to wonder if I care. He will never feel left behind. He will never wonder what he looked like as a baby. And he will never have to question my love. He will never have missing mom 
memories. Nicole, when I read that, it brought me to my knees for so many reasons because I truly understand when you look into your child's face for the first time and that's the first blood relative that you've met. And I think with, with adoptee parenting, we, we want so much to prevent pain in our own children. And I know that I have broadcast and forecast and projected so much on my son and trying to protect him from everything. And I just think it's such a beautiful thing to see what you went through and then the kind of mother you have been able to become and how much I think um, we're able to appreciate motherhood because we didn't experience it in the way that we should. And I just thank you for allowing us to be in that space together as mothers and, and to share that moment together. And, it, and I just wonder hearing that back, like, what are your thoughts, like hearing someone else read, read that to you? Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it means so much. It's, it's all the sadness and emptiness and pain from my childhood uh, and a paradox with the happiness and fulfillment and joy uh, from becoming a mother. And um, I had no idea how healing and life-changing uh, becoming a mother would be. And I can't forget how scared I was when I was pregnant with my son, Brayden, because I worried about my own ability to care for him and to love him and to bond with him because I thought, well, I didn't have this example. And how do I, how do I know? I've seen other mothers. I've seen television mothers. I know how Carol Brady does it, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I didn't know if I would be well-equipped or not. I was very fearful. And I actually wrote an, another um, blog about that experience and all my self-doubt. And that's definitely, you know, been one of my major challenges uh, as an adoptee. But that moment when the doctor placed Brayden in my hands for the first time and we connected, I just felt whole for the first time. Um, and that was a huge part of my healing journey. And um, he, he really... Uh, you know, I, I didn't realize that I, I knew that I felt like an alien growing up because I didn't look like anyone, but I didn't know how much I needed to see someone who did look like me <laughs> or, you know, uh, it was a, so that makes me think about uh, just how awful it is that children are, you know, separated from their families because, again, no matter how great your experience is, and sadly, a lot of experience aren't great like mine was, and I understand that, and that breaks my heart too. Um, I, it, it's just, it's, it's just terrible, and um, I had that was another major epiphany and surprise is having my son and feeling whole for the first time and feeling connected, really, truly connected, uh, to another person. And, um, I'll tell you one other thing that I do know that I'm still struggling with that really reinforces, uh, adoption as a lifelong journey is that when my son decided to go to the Navy after high school, I was, a mess. I want the best for him. I've been probably a little overprotective, but he knows <laughs> he that was my goal for him never to, you know, doubt my love for him. And we're still very close. Uh, um, but he's in California. He's closer to you than he is to me. <laughs> um, but when he left for boot camp and I couldn't communicate with him, I almost couldn't function. And that's how much a part of me uh, he is, and that was really eye-opening as well, is that I I felt guilty because I couldn't, I wanted to be happy for my son and his future and his career. And while I was, I was struggling so much with that separation because it, being around him for so long had been so healing for me. Um, so yeah, I, it's, I, 
I can't even put it into words. I'm glad you read that because I it, that, I wrote that a while ago. And um, that's exactly, you know, how I felt and uh, how much becoming a mother, uh, especially with all that self-doubt, um, really changed my life and was a significant part of my healing journey. Yeah, Nicole, I can so relate. Um, my son got married a little over a year ago to just this incredible woman. <clears throat> and the night before the wedding, I was so caught up in all the excitement of it. And I, and I remember laying in the bed and I was feeling the stretch marks on my tummy oh. where he had been. And there was such a feeling of just being scooped out, like the, the gravity of it that, you know, what this meant for for me as an adoptee it was just it was such an impactful situation i think our reaction to any sort of leaving is very difficult even though it's natural and normal and we want that for our children i think that i, I really appreciate you expressing the difficulty with that because i think that we do struggle with with any kind of leaving but certainly our children our first relative that we've met and and, you know, and of course, my son thinks I'm being overly dramatic because I can see him anytime I want. But It's like, <laughs> it's not the same. It's not the same, you know. Um, and I just I think now I'm coming to terms with that, as you probably are, and just seeing the joy and being able to release. But it's an excruciating process when you're in the middle of it, no matter how happy the circumstances are. And Absolutely. I think your ability and I think your ability to articulate with writing is something we certainly share. And I would like to know just a little bit more about, you know, what writing means to you and how it's helped you and, and you know, how it can help other adoptees. Yeah, that's a great question. I fell in love with the written word in uh, fifth grade uh, during a, a poetry <laughs> uh, project that I had. And um, I just loved this project. And I had, I had this opportunity to create my own book of poems, of original poems, funny, silly kid poems, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I included a couple uh, Robert Frost poems that my dad had taught me about. <laughs> I, my dad was actually a major influence in my uh, focus on communications from a young age. Uh, and uh, no wonder I ended up in marketing and uh, in corporate communications. But um, he was kind of conditioning me all along and I didn't realize it. But he had helped me with that project. And I remember, um, you know, uh, just working on it with him and just loving the power of written words to evoke emotion, even at that young age. And then illustrating each of my little poems with pictures and um, I was so proud of that, that little book and I still have it. Um, oh. <laughs> I was so proud of that, that, um, you know, I ended up, you know, really loving, um, English class and art class. And when I went on to college, I, uh, ended up studying, um, applied communication and, I uh, did. I, I went on for my master's in communication management, and um, what I loved is that I had a nice combination of both business writing as well as creative writing. And when I started doing creative writing in college, I found I like felt like I tapped into my voice for the first time because I was very shy as a child um, and very scared of a lot of things. And uh, I was still kind of shy when I went to, to college. I went to Notre Dame College of Ohio. It was an all-women's college at the time. And um, uh, one of my professors had taken an interest in me through my writing and, you know, told me about my potential. And she said I was, you know, I had a gift and that she wanted to help me nurture it. And she said, you could be a great communications professional. We just need to get you out of your shell. <laughs> and it wasn't until college that I, you know, realized that I, you know, had an opportunity to be more confident and expressive. And um, I'm so glad she did that because that opened up so many doors for me in my future career and in the things that I've done. Um, and I was uh, uh, still uh, challenged and, um, you know, played with self-doubt even in um, early days of my career. And I remember um, I had to give a presentation 
at um, a company uh, for the sales force and uh, they said, oh, you have to present at the national sales meeting. And, you know, it was the 90s. So it was a long time ago and I was very uh, early in my career. And I said, excuse me. (laughs) Um, I was really comfortable with the written word. I was not comfortable with um, speaking. So I forced myself to go to Toastmasters because I wanted to be good at it. And I was terrified and I knew it would hold me back. So, um, you know, I think I found uh, my voice through the written word and that led me to more and more opportunities to get out of my shell and help me connect with other people who then helped me, um, you know, tap into my, uh, my talents for, you know, not only for business, but obviously, um, it's really meaningful work, uh, for me in the adoptee community. And, uh, it's also honestly a, a form of therapy. Uh, when I, um, After my divorce um, from my son's father, I went through a time period where I would find myself, you know, writing just to to cope with the feelings I was having. And it really was a great outlet for me. And when you discover that your outlet that helps you can actually also help others, you know, that's a gift in itself. And I've always been motivated um, to to try to help others um, and I think that's why I was given, you know, the story I was given, why I had the opportunities I had. I feel like it's my personal responsibility because of my great experience and the insights that I've had and the things that I've been able to overcome to help others. And that's what I want to do. If I, if there's young people out there who are doubting themselves and on insecure um, and just don't believe in themselves, and I sure didn't, it took me a really long time um, to, to gain confidence um, I, I want to help them like, uh, the people who helped me, you know, through my years. So, um, I think it's an important form of self-expression, especially for adoptees, because you're not typically, and I don't want to speak for all adoptees, but I wasn't encouraged to talk about it. I was afraid to talk about it and, uh, writing it is a way to process your feelings. And I think it's really important, really impactful, and um, can help you sort through your feelings in a way that, um, you know, uh, gets you to a better place. Because once you start to process those feelings and understand, um, you know, why, if you connect them to being adopted, being abandoned, um, it's it's amazing uh, how you can really evolve and grow uh, from that. And uh, sharing that with others um, is definitely uh, challenging. But now that I've had, you know, success in my career in, in, in writing and communications, I figure, you know, the, the, the worst part for me is that it's my, it's my personal story and I could be judged for it, but I I'm, I'm learning to get over that too, because of all the great connections I've had with, um, other adoptees and, um, even the adoptee who connected us, uh, you know, I've shared with him, with Jim (laughs) and, um, Jim. (laughs) (laughs) and he's been great. And I found him through my blog. He, he found me through my blog and we became friends and we've never met in person, but he inspires me all the time and he connected me to you. So writing can open doors and to meaningful relationships and meaningful connections that can help on the healing journey. There's no question, Nicole. And Jim Serrano, we love you. He feels like I just this, I don't want to call him a giant spider, but he's just like this wonderful connector. He makes this beautiful web of people and he, he has so much joy in connecting. And I think you know, speaking about writing and expressing, we highly value that with the project that we're trying to do. We believe so strongly in the power of expression, whether it's art or music, because I think you you pointed out something really important, Nicole, that a lot of times we don't feel safe enough to share a voice and our fears, but maybe we can put it in a journal or maybe we can paint it or maybe we can pretend or imagine or act or I mean there's so many different ways to express that I think are very healing and so being able to encourage that in others is really important and then also being able to share it in the way you said it progressed from written in a journal hidden away to being your career and then ultimately your advocacy 
what a beautiful testimony to what is possible. And I think, Nicole, you know, I just want to open up the floor to you and say, what other points would you like to make? What are some things that we haven't covered yet that are really important to you to get across? If there's anything you can think of. Yeah. Um, when we talked beforehand, you had posed a question about coping. And I thought it was interesting because as I reflected on that, it really helped me see how coping has changed, you know, over time and through different periods of my life. And uh, it made me think about how unfortunate it is that so many children have these feelings and don't even know what they're coping with and they internalize it. And that was a big problem for me. And I think it led to, you know, some unhealthy relationships. And um, those are connections that are important. They're not easy to talk about, but they're important to talk about. And that's why, you know, having these conversations, real conversations about the real adoptee experience is so important because I hope someone out there listening uh, can connect the dots in their own life and say, wow, you know, I had no idea that, you know, this these feelings could be connected to uh, being abandoned and being adopted. And, um, you know, maybe they'll feel better about themselves. So um, it's a shame that, you know, that children have to cope without understanding what's wrong and in making them feel, you know, uh, internalizing that to feel inferior. It's a terrible thing for children to feel inferior. I mean, being a child is tough. Um, and I think probably tougher today than it was, uh, when you know we were growing up uh so adding that on top of it is is just really sad and so i just want everyone to know that um there's uh, a lot of behaviors like you know distractions and unhealthy relationships and lack of boundaries uh, that could be happening in a child, teen, or, you know, even someone in their twenties in, in, or, and in beyond, uh, life, uh, that, that are unhealthy, um, you know, uh, behaviors that stem from not connecting the dots and not understanding that your, uh, pain and your reaction is absolutely a normal reaction to an abnormal circumstance. And that is so important for everyone to understand. Um, I know we adoptees understand it, but the, you know, general population needs to understand that, um, that adoptees are in a position where, you know, we can be labeled and judged and, and it's not, it's not our fault, right? I mean, we have these, we have, it's not fair that we have to deal with these lifelong challenges and feeling, you know, these feelings uh, without any help. So I just encourage everyone out there to connect with other adoptees, whether it's in your local community or online. And you don't have to make it your art. You don't have to write, um, you know, beautiful mm. prose. Just share your story and you'll be surprised. I know it's hard to do, but you'll be surprised at what happens. And those healing connections um, can make a huge difference. So if anyone's dealing with, um, you know, issues that they're not certain about, um, uh, you know, I just want them to kind of help, help them connect those dots. Um, cause there's a lot of patterns and themes now every adoptee's experience is different, but a lot of those patterns and themes, um, you know, are shared and, um, everyone who has those issues should understand that it doesn't have to be that way and they can change and they can get better and uh, there is help and they're not alone. That's really important to uh, one of my most important messages, especially in my writing um, is you're not alone. Uh, you are lovable and you are valuable. And those are the things that I did not feel growing up. And I want every adoptee to know that they are absolutely lovable, valuable, and definitely not alone. Oh, you got me again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Oh, Nicole, that was absolutely beautiful. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Heidi. Don't apologize. 
I know I keep telling all the podcast, you know, audience, I keep crying during these. Hopefully I'll get it <laughs> together at some point. So I think this is a really good time to, to tell you a little ritual that I do. I have this amazing quote box. I'm obsessed with quotes. And I kind of pray to whoever, whatever is out there before I do an interview to just ground myself and I pull a quote out. And what I'd like to believe is intended for you. And okay. this is the one, this is the one that I pulled out. But there is suffering in life and there are defeats. No one can avoid them. But it is better to lose some of the battles and the struggle for your dreams than to be defeated without ever knowing what you're fighting for. And I think it's, it's very clear, Nicole, that you know what you're fighting for, the healing of the pain that adoptees feel. And this time with you has been absolutely extraordinary. And I know many people are going to be helped by this conversation. Um, I hope so. And now, Yes. And if you, you know, I think it would be really amazing to end with maybe you telling us like the good news about your life right now. Where, where have you like, I don't know, where are you at on your healing journey, I guess, would be the question. I love that as a last question because I can uh, smile and be happy instead of crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we already um, cried a lot, so let's... <laughs> yes, um, full circle. Actually, I'm in a great place right now, Heidi. I am the happiest I have ever been. I am... Uh, I've recently, um, uh, actually major life, uh, milestone. I recently, um, got married. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, thank Aww. you. On, uh, March 13th, I was married and, um, my son was able to be there. And actually, Aww. uh, I, it was, uh, one of those, uh, um, June 2020 uh, weddings that was postponed because of the pandemic. So I was dealing with that stress and we had actually moved it to this June. And then when we found out that Braden could come home from the Navy and he hasn't been home in uh, over 20 months. Um, and that wow. is that has been heartbreaking. Uh, the last two Christmases, uh, last two birthdays, I have not seen him. Um, but he made it home and I was so happy. So we, I said, we have to make this happen when he's home and I don't care what we have to do to make it happen. We are going to make it happen. <laughs> and the cherry on top is, uh, my father, who I mentioned at the beginning, um, became a, a, a priest after a Catholic priest after, um, uh, raising me, he entered the seminary actually when I was in college. Um, <laughs> we were both in school at the same time. Um, he married us. Uh, so um, I'm super, super happy in my love life. In my, I'm a newlywed. Uh, I saw my son recently and um, doing great at work as well. Um, I'm going on almost two years with an, a wonderful company um, called Part Source. And uh, I get a lot of fulfillment from my job as the senior director of marketing uh, for the Enterprise Channel as well as corporate communications because we are focused on healthcare and uh, we uh, help with supply chain solutions for uh, some of the major uh, health systems across the country. So um, I love what I'm doing at home and at work. And I saw my son recently, so my heart is full. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm happy to be here talking to you. So um, all good on all counts. I'm so glad, Nicole. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for this time together. And I hope we get to meet one day. And certainly I would love to have you back on to talk more. Thank you so much, Heidi. I appreciate it. Okay. Good night, Nicole. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.